Welcome back, everybody. Um, this is going to be the first of our two panels on collaborations across the disciplines. Um, first, what I'd like is for each panelist to briefly introduce themselves when I, when I prompt them. Um, when you're asking questions, and there'll be a mixture of questions that, that um, Al Volkening and I will ask as, as moderators, but also questions from you, please use the Q&A. So this is different from what we've been doing with the talks. We'll be taking questions from, from the Q&A. Um, okay, so in the order on my screen, um, Joseph, Joseph, if you could go, go first and give a couple minutes. Sure, um, I'm Joe Tian. Uh, so I'm in the math department at OSU. Um, as far as collaborating across disciplines, um, for me, this has been something kind of from the get-go. I, I was originally a biologist back in the day um, before uh, turning coat and, uh, and joining the applied math ranks. Um, so uh, one area of my research is on infectious disease modeling, um, disease spread on networks. Um, starting in about 2016, um, I've also begun working on uh, problems related to online uh, spread of content, um, far-right extremism and polarization. Um, and so this latter work has been in collaboration with um, lots of different folks, but as, as far as collaboration outside of math, it's included work with um, uh, journalists, um, such as Luke O'Brien at HuffPost, and also some uh, interaction with organizations like the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, we've all had our lives upended by COVID. Um, so in the last, uh, so since the pandemic, I've, I've gotten involved with various um, COVID-related projects uh, to support decision-making by groups like the Ohio Department of Health, Ohio Hospital Association, and also uh, at, at Ohio State. Um, and so that's uh, necessitated uh, work with folks um, working on uh, policy decisions, law, um, student life, and, and those sorts of considerations. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of close by those two areas of my work um, infectious disease and online content really have come together in terms of COVID. Um, so with misinformation related to COVID. Um, and so uh, in a more recent project, uh, um, collaborating with some colleagues in communications and political science and uh, public policy, looking at spread of COVID related misinformation specifically. Um, so happy to be here. Okay, thank you. Um, just as a quick announcement, I think there's some people who may need to, to, to mute. There's been some reports of background noise, so please check if you're muted. And with that, um, Rediet, if you'll give a brief intro. Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to the organizers of this panel for inviting me and to everyone else for being here. I'm really happy to be here with you all. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm an assistant professor of computer science at UC Berkeley. I'm, uh, I was previously a junior fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows, which I just wrapped up. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a co-founder and co-organizer of a large research initiative called Mechanism Design for Social Good, or MD4SG. And through this initiative, we bring together researchers um, and practitioners um, to use techniques from algorithms, optimization, mechanism design, as well as related um, techniques to see whether we can improve access to opportunity for disadvantaged communities. So if you're interested in learning more, I'll drop the link to the initiative and I'm excited to share some of what, we, what we've learned through that initiative as well as um, uh, learn from what you all have to say um, on uh, collaborating across disciplines. Thank you. Okay, Sandra. Hi. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Sandra Gonzalez Bailon. I'm also very happy to be here. I've known Mason for a, a number of years, and I don't think we have a chance to <laughs> engage in a lot of, of official conference venues, but this is great. Um, I'm a sociologist by training, um, and right now I'm an associate professor of communication at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, broadly interested on networks and how networks shape exposure to information and the diffusion of content. Um, and so I'm involved in projects that explore how networks operate in the context of political mobilizations, but also in terms of how people get access to news and, and information. And so to my co-panelists, we should talk. Um, and I have worked with uh, physicists, applied mathematicians within the social sciences, even though I'm a sociologist, I'm in a communication school. I work a lot with uh, political scientists as well. And to me, the lingua franca that connects us all uh, 
comes from networks, network science, network theory, and I, and I think that's the common ground that, that uh, has um, allowed me to engage in collaborations with, with colleagues in a wide range of domains. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion and to learning more about my co-panelists, but also whoever is in the audience. Um, Thanks so much. So to get us started, uh, I have a question on just kind of general advice and tips that y'all have for making initial connections across disciplines. So, you know, whether you're connecting with social scientists or connecting with mathematicians, um, for folks who maybe haven't done that before, how do you, uh, what, what are your tips and advice? So is this a first, that, that was, I'll, I'll go first. <laughs> go for it. Um, so, so I was, I, just before joining the, the panel, I was just writing down a, a few ideas and thinking, what is the most important advice that, that some, I wish someone would have given me um, uh, when I was finishing my PhD? And I think the most important part of, of, of this type of collaboration has to do with how you define a problem. So defining a research problem in a way that's conducive to fruitful collaborations is the most important part. And when I say define a research problem, I wanna make sure that everyone understands that to my mind that is very different from identifying the motivation for your work. Um, you know, you might wanna reduce bias or inequality in society, or you might want to improve democracy. Um, and, and those are important and worthy questions that relate to the motivation of your research agenda, but those are very intractable if you don't find a way of delimiting the scope of the question and sort of the, the empirical context and the data. And uh, when I look back at all the fruitful collaborations, but also some unfruitful collaborations that didn't lead to, to you know, they were like, um, um, you know, didn't lead to any successful outputs. I think the, the, the reason why sometimes we've been successful and sometimes we haven't has to do with how you define the problem. And so I think that identifying a, a, a research area, identifying the, 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 the scope of the problem, agreeing on definitions and uh, agreeing on a, on, a, on a strategy to attack that problem is really the very first and most important step you have to take to ensure that these type of collaborations will be successful. I'm going to quickly follow up um, with a, I'm going to steal a line from Lou Gross uh, at, at Nimbus in Tennessee. His advice is, I'll take out the curse words, uh, don't don't work with unkind people. Um, so I, I feel like, uh, yeah, I mean, the single most important thing I think is finding people that you really can trust and, and work well with and kindness goes a huge way. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's good advice from Lou. Yeah, that's very good advice. Even if you're not working across disciplines, I think that's good to <laughs> good to keep in mind whatever you're doing. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Sandra's point about the problem formulation. I think that's a very crucial um, aspect of working on any project, obviously, but especially ones that straddle disciplines. So I, you know, in my I'm fairly junior as these things go, but even in my sort of limited experience, one thing I've observed that's really stood out to me is that um, uh, sort of how I define research has really expanded as a result of working across disciplines. So I think uh, initially I was a mathematician. I was um, even going to just go off and do a math PhD. And I sort of changed my mind last minute and I moved into computer science. And so when I was you know, solely in math or solely in computer science, um, I sort of had, like, I think, a more narrow idea of what counts as research, but now I think I've had more experience working across disciplines, and so my 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 idea of what research is has also expanded. And so, um, just to give you an example, so one of the things that we're doing in um, the MD for SG initiative, uh, which has had a technical workshop series and is now becoming its own cyber conference, is that um, we have different submission types that are sort of creative, I think. So we have um, submission types that are problem pitches. Um, and that was meant to sort of include people who go off, they learn a lot about some discipline or some specific domain, they learn quite a bit about it. And then there's some research question that they might ask about it. And then the actual sort of solution to that research might not be, um, uh, it might not be like technically sophisticated, right? It might even be using sort of more off the shelf methods. And so we noticed that a lot of, um, in computer science, a lot of conferences, which is where 
we publish most of our work tend to not look very favorably upon that, right? They read the paper and they say, well, you know, you use sort of off-the-shelf methods, there's not much novelty here, so maybe we won't accept the paper or maybe we won't think very highly of it. But of course, a lot of work has gone in the background, right, to, to kind of make the right connections with people, to really learn about a domain, to identify what is a question that we can ask here that could really be useful for, for people, for other disciplines, whatever it is. And so we have this track that's particular, specifically for, um, uh, for just formulating problems, right? Just saying, here's a problem, here's why it hasn't been solved, here's what people have tried in the past, here's why it's been a challenge. And just that, even just formulating the problem itself can be a very meaningful contribution. And so that's something that um, really has just expanded my, my view of research. Um, another thing I've learned uh, that's been helpful for me is to go into um, collaborations uh, across disciplines and also outside of academia with an open mind. Um, I, you know, I go in, you know, my training kicks in. And so I usually have sort of my knee jerk questions that I tend to ask, right? If you give me data and you tell me you care about something, I'm like, oh, I wonder if we can predict that, right? That's a sort of like an automatic computational question to ask. It's not always the best question, right? I've had um, research um, projects where we had data, uh, we have search data and we were looking at health information needs. Oh, actually, we were looking at health in Africa and we focused on HIV and AIDS. And we thought, why don't we use search data to predict HIV prevalence rates? And I talked to you know several health experts, and it was very clear within even just a few short conversations that that was just not a helpful question to ask. And in fact, there were many ways in which it could be harmful, right? Because we're in a setting where there's not that much ground truth data on HIV prevalence rates. And so you don't even know what you're predicting. And of course, there's all the sort of uh, limitations that come with the data set that we had. And so it was interesting to me that through that conversation, it was sort of obvious the knee jerk question that I was asking was not necessary, was not useful, maybe even maybe even harmful. But there were other questions that were more exploratory, that were sort of more descriptive, that um, health experts said that they would find much more useful. And so we ended up instead um, doing a more descriptive analysis of um, examining what information needs are being exhibited through the data set and we can just look at patterns there and so I thought that was a, a sort of like a for me it was very it was a very helpful lesson to learn and I learned this in graduate school that was helpful for me and the last thing I'll say is that um, it's quite risky to work across disciplines especially for junior scholars um, if you're applying to faculty positions if you're going out for promotions it can be very risky right because you can invest a lot of time and energy and maybe it doesn't necessarily work out um, and you have to kind of like really sort of reinvent the wheel in some ways right you have to create new connections learn new languages uh, from other disciplines and things like that um, and I don't think everyone has to do this really I don't think everyone has to work across disciplines I think that's totally okay but um, for those of I mean for me I, I really enjoy that a lot I, I think it gives me sort of a lot more purpose uh, for my work and so for that I found that these investments are lifelong investments, right? It's not, you know, you may create some connections and really try to learn some language uh, for one project or really try to get to know some uh, people or, uh, you know, some domain for one project, but really you can just kind of keep tapping into that same uh, kind of well, right? You can tap into that well of like knowledge that you have or links that you've made with different disciplines or different people and, and keep coming back to that. And so for me, it's really helped to think about how, yes, it's risky, but if you really want to do it, you can think of these initial things that you're uh, uh, that you're doing as a sort of uh, an investment and laying the groundwork for many more collaborations. These are um, great, great responses. All right, so the next question is from an anonymous attendee and it's also been upvoted a, a whole bunch. Uh, so this is, um, how many overlaps are there between models for biology and for social science? I think particularly Joe would be interested in, you know, Freddie and Sandra as well. And are there approaches that are unique for social systems that don't come from biology? And I will add on to that for those of you who have, you know, collaborated with biologists and with social scientists, what like, are there differences in that experience that we should be aware of and tips and advice you have for that? I mean, I think it's a great question. Um, there's certainly some core stuff that comes in really handy, um, whether you're working in bio or social systems. Um, it, it's probably related to one other question that I saw there about um, uh, graph theory and network science that, that Sandra mentioned also as being a, a, a common language. Like there's some core, set, core um, material that I find myself applying, whether I'm working in a disease spread setting or a social setting. I do think that there's differences. There's a temptation to want to use um, to like kind of pull out some simple models from one setting and apply them. And 
um, those can be fruitful and useful, but I think it's it's important to do that with uh, care. Um, so whether you're looking in social sciences or in biology, there's been a ton of background work that's been done, um, lots of theory that's been developed. Uh, and so um, whether those models, like if you're using an SIR model, let's say uh, very common framework in, in a disease setting, applying it for um, you know, transmission of, of opinion um, might be right or it might be totally wrong for, for a given system. And so, uh, so it, it's, it's something to think about. And I think tapping into the, the theory that's been developed in those disciplines and coming into their, the collaborations with a lot of humility is, um, is, is helpful. Yeah, I mean, I, I just jump in quickly just to reinforce those points. I thought, I thought the, the, you know, I don't have much uh, else to add. I think I agree completely uh, with what Joseph just said. Um, um, and I, I think what makes uh, cross-disciplinary collaboration so interesting and attractive is sometimes, you know, it's like when you have a hammer and you're only looking for nails, right? It's like cliche, but it's true. Um, and you know, if you only know about SIR models, then you're gonna to try to fit everything into those models, right? But at the same time, if you don't know about those models and just understanding how they simplify what is essentially a very complex reality and to try to identify the elemental building blocks, that can also be instructive in terms of streamlining, again, how you think about the problem. And the conclusion might very well be that those models are not the best to model, you know, in a particular social context, the, you know, specific social dynamics, but, um, I, I do think that the best, most creative and imaginative work happens when we revisit some of the assumptions that we take for granted in scientific research. Sometimes there's a lot of inertia. It's just saying you keep on doing things in a particular way because that's how everybody did them in the past. And of course you want to be published in certain journals. And so those journals um, you know, are more likely to accept work that don't question certain assumptions. And, um, and I think just questioning assumptions for the sake of it doesn't, it's not necessarily a good thing to do, but it, it's all, I think when you question some of those assumptions, when, when this is more likely to happen is when you talk to people outside of your comfort zone, outside of your domain, who may be asking questions that a priori may seem very simple, but if you dig a little bit deeper, they're actually going to the fundamentals of why you're thinking about a particular problem in a particular way. And, and that might lead to revisiting some of those uh, assumptions in a way that no one would have thought about doing before, right? Um, uh, and so uh, if only for that, I think sometimes it's good to be pushed outside of your comfort zone to be nagged as like, oh, but that's a very simple model, like society is way more complicated than that. And of course, you know, if that's the last thing you say, that's not going to be very useful for anybody. Of course, everything is complicated. Our goal is to make it simpler. Um, but sometimes it's good to be pushed, right, and to question uh, the, the way we think about problems. Um, Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add to what my colleagues already said. One thing I'll just mention, though, is that especially when doing work that's um, that's kind of multidisciplinary, I think it's uh, it's really worth investing in uh, not just seeing the paper through as a paper, right? I think a lot of times when we you know we submit a paper, it gets accepted, we get to present it at the conference if um, we present in conferences, maybe we give some seminars, and that's that, right? But if you're if you're doing something that crosses multiple disciplines or whatever, whatever it is that it crosses that um, that involve communities that don't typically interact with one another. It's really worthwhile thinking about ways of um, sharing that research beyond just as a paper, right? So um, one of the things that uh, I'll just to give you an example. So one of the things that we're doing in a project that we've been working on on um, I'm sort of understanding data economies across the African continent. So we have this paper that's using a lot of uh, both sort of market design thinking, but also um, science and technology studies and just more generally critical uh, scholarship. So we have this paper and um, it recently got accepted. We're excited about it, but we're also making sure that um, we're sharing it in many different ways. So one of the things that we're doing is we we cite and we, we uncover and we cite a lot of um, African scholarship as a result of this paper, um, uh, even though a lot of times in this type of work, the citations tend to come from a lot of um, Western based scholars. And so we have this sort of database of African African scholars and their work that we just want to share with the community that we had to do as part of our research, but we're sharing it more broadly. So we're, we're doing that. We're writing general audience pieces. Uh, we're actually creating these um, uh, sort of storybooks that demonstrate um, 
common narratives about data practices in Africa and then counter, counter narratives that are um, really more informed by kind of decolonial work. Right. And so, so we have this paper, but we also have these like stories and uh, we're creating these kind of graphics associated with these stories. And, and that's intended to just kind of make sure that um, the work is reaching, sure, a research audience, but also maybe people want to use that for their classrooms, right? Um, if, they, if they're teaching data science classes, or maybe people want to use it for um, training uh, folks in policy across the continent and things like that. And so, um, yeah, so I think just thinking beyond just the sort of paper publication model uh, to, to share the work as broadly as we can. Great. Thank you all. So the next question comes from Kaisa. Um, Besides disciplines, there's also industry in academia, which of course for things like data science and machine learning is gonna be really important. Um, any advice on working with collaborators with similar interests, but then different goals um, and in, in incentives? Um, and I don't know who wants to, to start with this, but I think all three of you probably have a lot to say about this one. Yeah, I'll go. So, so this is, um... This is a tricky one because I think, of course, especially in the social sciences, um, where collaboration with the private sector wasn't perhaps as, as, as common as in more technical disciplines, it's becoming increasingly important, um, but also increasingly challenging because of all the limitations to data access and, and, you know, and the potential impact that conducting research with platforms like social media platforms, for example, like Facebook or Twitter, um, you know, there's been a few high profile cases of research done in collaboration between academia and industry uh, that then, you know, blew in the face of the researchers in the sense of public responses to that research that weren't very positive. Uh, those studies raised ethical concerns. And, and so, you know, it wasn't easy to begin with to get access to the sort of data that only uh, uh, private corporations like Facebook or, or, or Google have. Um, uh, and in that, and, you know, and, and this privacy protections that need to be in place. And it's becoming increasingly tricky because, you know, as you all know, after the 2020 elections, <laughs> you know, like there's, these are high stakes questions, what happens on, on, on many of these platforms. And, um, you know, we need transparency. We need to understand exactly what the impact of those platforms on society um, is. Uh, but getting access to the data is very difficult. And, and when you get access to the data, how you analyze the data is a kind of complicated as well. And so, and these are all questions that require, um, you know, a set of infrastructure uh, uh, sort of in place uh, um, that we don't necessarily have uh, with, uh, in terms of how we think about this collaboration between industry and universities um, that guarantees the legitimacy of the research and transparency while protecting uh, privacy, uh, but also kind of the bottom line of these organizations or these companies, because otherwise, you know, the collaboration will not prosper. And these are very early days. I'm not sure, um, you know, I'm not sure I have clear answers, but I've been involved in recent months in our collaboration with Facebook colleagues, for example, that is designed explicitly to understand the impact of the platform on the elections. And this involved, you know, months of brainstorming, months of discussions between academics who are not, we are not being paid by Facebook. We are, there's no conflict of interest. We are posing the questions and the data scientists working for the platform. And we all have the same goal, which is to, to find answers to questions that we think are important that will help us evaluate the impact that platforms like Facebook have on the democratic process and elections. Um, but, but, but we've been learning along the way in the sense that, uh, you know, again, like there's a lot of things that you have to balance, a lot of trade-offs that you have to make. And so, for example, there were many instances where we academics wanted to get access to data that we wouldn't, that, that the data scientists or Facebook wouldn't give us access to very granular data at the individual level because they want to protect the privacy of those users, right? And so, and then you keep on negotiating. So what kind of interesting questions can we answer with granular enough data that will protect privacy um, while giving us the information that we need to do the research? And we came up with, these, uh, you know, these will all be public at some point once we have the studies completed, but the studies are essentially pre-registered. So we all wrote pre-analysis plans. There was an announcement a few months back about this collaboration. Um, all the individual level data that we got access to uh, got prior informed consent by the participants. 
But so it's been a long process that I think has given us some guidelines as to what works and what doesn't work. I think the whole idea of us academics posing the questions and devising the pre-analysis plans, which are, you know, they are pre-registered uh, as a way of like a contract, right? Like it's gonna hold, you know, the, the, we're gonna produce what we promise we would produce. It's a contract between us and, the, and, and our colleagues uh, at Facebook. Uh, I think this is the way to go, but but there's not enough experience, at least in the social sciences, on how we can do this in a fruitful manner that would not undermine the credibility of the research, but will also will not undermine future opportunities for collaboration with industry. Because obviously, if this again becomes a scandal in terms of you know what well, we, we've experimented with Facebook users we had with, without having their consent, you know this ethical that's an ethical problem. And so, so so it's very early on to to still kind of give like a set of these other things that need to be in place, but I think we're learning along the way. And, and I think I'm way more optimistic now than I was a couple of years ago about how fruitful these sort of collaborations can be. But I just finished by saying that they are increasingly relevant, especially and in the social sciences, we didn't used to have a lot of collaboration with the private sector or with industry. And this is becoming increasingly important. And I think we need more of it. Yeah, I can just quickly add that um, I mean, it, just to follow up on some of the points that were raised in terms of um, working with groups um, outside of academia, uh, as the original question asked, the, the motivations are often different. Um, and I think one general thing that's um, important to keep in mind is, is how, or just something to wrestle with is, how do you maintain your scientific objectivity? Um, so especially in advocacy work, for example, um, you might ask a question where you, you think that the, the reason that you're asking a question, like, so um, is hate speech crossing from one group into the mainstream via these routes? You might have a suspicion as to what, what the routes are and the pol political and social ramifications of it are. Um, but, and this is something that Mason has emphasized uh, to me many times and I, I appreciate it. Once you ask the question and you start to dive into the work, right, it, it becomes a research problem and the answer doesn't have to be what you want it to be. And I think as researchers, we all know that, but the groups that you're working with might not appreciate it in quite the same way. Um, they've got a vested interest in, in an answer coming out a certain way, right? And so, and they're realistically often under timelines that are much faster than our academic work, right? We, we, we work on a problem, there's a topical issue right now, Two years later, we publish a paper um, from the from the advocacy organization. They're like, "Well, that wasn't very helpful for me, right?" And so, um, if you're working on a project where the objective is not the paper, or at least that's not the sole purpose, you're you're trying to work in some sort of way to affect change on a quick time scale. You can't go through all of the same level of detail. So, what's the level of rigor that you don't want to sacrifice to still be confident of your conclusion? and have it actionable is a tension that's hard to resolve, but I think it's one that's important to kind of always keep in mind. Yeah, I appreciate both of these points. Um, I, I, I would wanna, I wanna add a complimentary uh, perspective, which I hope is also just maybe a challenge, right? I think a lot of times when we talk about working um, with academics versus not academics, we immediately just think about like the big tech corporations, right? We, you know, it's oftentimes we think of um, like Facebook or Google or Amazon, Microsoft. Um, and it usually, at least in my corner of computer science, it usually sort of ends there. And um, of course, there's a lot of really amazing collaborations that can come out of, um, of working with these large tech corporations. And I don't want to dismiss those. Um, a lot of my colleagues have worked on, on similar problems. But um, for me, what's been sort of really um, eye-opening is that it, it's, I think we have to ask why, right? Like, why do we want to work with uh, people, you know, outside of our discipline or outside of even academia? And oftentimes it comes down to like a few, a few things, right? It could be that there's some data that's like really valuable and you can only get access to it if you're at Microsoft, right? Which was the case for the project that I mentioned earlier. It could be some sort of like resources, like maybe computing resources or so, some sort of funding um, that's really kind of uh, only available in certain corners of, of industry, uh, or it's, you know, oftentimes I think it's that people just want to have like a real impact with their research. They want to solve problems that um, that feel kind of pressing to some industry and they want to work on those and do research, research on that. And I think for the first two things, right, like sort of data or other types of resources, there's, um, 
I don't think we just have to give in, right? I think that like we can put pressure on uh, like, you know, I, I don't really want to work with uh, Facebook or Google and never really have, um, but you know, they have data that's really, really um, kind of rich, right? And so we really need to think creatively about, you know, what other pressures do we want to put on there? If you feel that working with these types of corporations is going to feel like a compromise to you in some sort of way, then, um, then are there other kind of levers that we have at our disposal? The other thing I want to add is also that um, from you know talking to people in the public sector and also talking to people in NGOs and nonprofits, it's been really remarkable for me to see how excited they are about the prospect of working with uh, computational scholars, which is what I what I talk to them about. And and yet there's not really that many mechanisms for kind of bridging bridging that. And so, for instance, at Berkeley, where I'm a faculty member, we have a corporate access program that. Um, a lot of the big tech corporations and many others are a part of, they pay into this program and that gives them sort of access to the student body, right? So if you're a student at Berkeley, you wanna do an internship uh, at one of these corporations, it's it's just much, much easier than if you wanted to work at say an NGO or if you wanted to work in the kind of public sector uh, setting or you want to work with people in NGOs or public sector settings. And so I really think we should um, think about that. I think we can think, think about it as an individual problem. We can think about like what we, should, what we can all do but I think it's also helpful to recognize that there's some structural uh, deficiencies here and some so, some structural challenges in terms of facilitating that kind of work, uh, both in just even making that connection, but also um, uh, in terms of like risk, right? Like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, our idea of what research is, is is something that we get to decide. So we can expand that or contract that as we see appropriate. And so if something requires, you know, a lot of uh, like a very long process of just kind of getting to know uh, an NGO, getting to know some problem, and and it's only a year or two years later that you kind of get to like a concrete question. Maybe there's a way we can still kind of give credit to people for the work that they've done up until that point. Um, and I'll just mention as a quick example. So one, one thing I really, really like about Berkeley um, or the UC system more generally is there is the, um, the California Policy Lab, which is this... Uh, I think it's like a UC wide lab or maybe it's just UC Berkeley and UCLA that um, basically kind of takes some of that risk. So they basically work directly with um, say a lot of uh, kind of departments within the state of California. They kind of have their own uh, data sharing agreement and kind of research um, collaboration agreement with a lot of uh, these sort of public sector um, departments that you might be thinking of or people that you might be thinking of. And um, and so as a researcher or as a faculty member in this in, at this university, I'm able to go and say, hey, uh, you know, what do you guys have available? And then they can kind of make that make that link. And the intention there was to make sure that, you know, I don't have to go out into, you know, the California Department of Social Services and start from scratch and try to make connections, try to, you know, do all, all this stuff and take years before I even get to the point where I, where I have access to data, right? They've already done that. And so, um, uh, so I'm sort of able to to uh, kind of just benefit from the work that they've already put in. And so I think institutions could put in things like that that inherit some of that risk to um, to make it easier, especially for sort of more junior faculty and more junior researchers more generally to to do this kind of work. Thanks so much. So uh, a lot of the questions in the chat are kind of um, related to making those initial connections uh, across disciplines. And so specifically from Amanda Lundberg, uh, she was wondering kind of generally how you make those connections. I think the initial initial connections and specifically, you know, do you recommend going to out of field conferences or workshops? Are there specific conferences or workshops you'd recommend professional societies or ways of searching through the literature that would help people as they're building the connections initially? I've got a funny story about about so so going to out of field conferences, I think is in my personal experience, I think that that might not be the way to go. So uh, so uh, this is in, long ago, I was starting to work on waterborne diseases. And, and so I was like, oh, this is great. I'll go to this, um, you know, I've got some ideas about uh, how this model could adapt to include more fluid mechanics. I'll go to this Gordon, Gordon conference on, um, uh, that has to do with this area. And it was like, I felt completely foreign and it was like a complete waste. Um, I'm not saying, so there might be other ways to do it, but for me, that's not fruitful. One thing that I think um, has been helpful for me uh, is is kind of like a graph theoretic way in terms of you find the hub of somebody who can connect you to the right person. Um, 
So uh, for, for some work that's been related to policy and online extremism, it was me connecting with a friend who's uh, kind of a mover in DC who I knew from kind of in other circumstances, like, hey, I'm working on this. I know that you're interested in these different social justice issues. Who should I talk to? And that person who knows a bunch of other people is like, oh, you should talk to X, Y, and Z. You should send your work here. And that's tremendously helpful. Um, within ac academia, there, there, this, I think the same sort of, sort of thing applies, right? If you're trying to make connections in network science or um, in disease modeling, there are certain people that readily come to mind who you could reach out to, um, or somebody might help you kind of introduce you to them to then connect you to uh, someplace where it might be fruitful to go. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Uh, look for the help. But the other is be proactive. Like, I think one of my most fruitful and exciting collaborations um, came out. I was in a conference, a disciplinary conference. I was in the, in the audience. I was bored looking on my feed. And I saw this paper being advertised that I thought was very cool, but they had missed the very important question that I wanted to ask of that data. And so I just reached out to the authors. And, we set up a Skype meeting and that was it. That, we didn't really know each other in person. We didn't have any intermediaries. We had the same nationality though. <laughs> um, and so we, yeah, that's how we started. And then, you know, there was a face-to-face -face meeting at some point. And then, you know, that was, you know, there was really a lot of, uh, as someone said before, there was a lot of a good connection also on a personal level. Uh, I think it was you, Joseph, who said this, you know, someone you like, we, we liked each other and we kept on working and we, we you know, it was, but, but I think the key here is they have to be proactive. Like you don't expect collaborations to come looking for you, right? <laughs> Collaborators, like you have to be the one who, the minute you read a paper that you enjoy, reach out to the authors. I think all of us are happy when we get emails uh, saying, I love your work, I, I look, it could, you know, but I had this idea that you didn't seem to have tried. And so, you know, and sometimes these things work, sometimes they don't work, but like the, the, even when they don't work, if you engage in those sort of reaching out <laughs> initiatives, I think that that means you're doing your job well, right? And so, so be proactive. Yeah, absolutely, be proactive. I also think start, um, uh, start local maybe or small, I'm not sure how to phrase it, but I think a lot of times when people are interested in uh, crossing this boundary, they're sort of like, okay, I wanna work with like an organization, okay, I'm gonna to try to find someone in the WHO, or you know, I wanna work with someone in uh, like biology, oh, this person has a Nobel Prize, right? And like, those are less likely to pan out than, than ones that are maybe more, more local to you, maybe more local organizations, but also um, if you're thinking of researchers, find someone who may not be a Nobel Prize winner, but is working on something that that you're interested in, maybe there's actually something that you that you sh that you share, right? Like maybe you're both interested in sort of housing related issues, and one person is uh, an economist or a sociologist, and the other person is a computer scientist or a mathematician or something, right? And so, uh, fine, maybe you don't necessarily have the shared language from your disciplines, but you have the shared interest of housing. And so, I think, uh, yeah, be proactive. I, I completely agree, and also um, start local. Okay. Um, our next question is from from Don. Um, what are good ways to detect ideally early and navigate when interdisciplinary groups use the same terminology, but with say different um, discipline specific meanings? Any thoughts? I think like as with any relationship, you have to talk, 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 and make sure that you don't take anything for granted. I mean, I'm not sure how early, what early means here, uh, but it, but I wouldn't say that you know using terminology, sort of using the same words to refer to different things, that also applies within disciplines sometimes, right? It pretty much depends on your epistemological approach to things, and um, and so you know I, I think. Again, don't be in, 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 looking back, <laughs> right? Like, uh, so I think the biggest advice I can give is don't be afraid of asking questions, even if you think that they are stupid questions or that they are like obvious questions. Like, don't be afraid of asking, but what do you mean when you say X? Or what do you mean when you say Y? Or why do we mean these? When we, and, and, um, and try to overcome you know, those gaps in understanding or terminology as early as possible. But the, there's no, you know, the, sometimes in the process of discussing, you know, the positions change as well. I mean, I don't, I, I can't think of 
um, you know, one of the things that I like about network science is that at least when you talk about basic terms, I mean, everyone agrees on, on the basic terms and, you know, when you're measuring things, everybody knows what those measures, how those measures are calculated. But of course, what changes is how you interpret those measures, right? And so, um, uh, the only way to, to, I mean, I don't know, talk and ask questions and don't be afraid of asking questions even if you think that they are, uh, that they are, they are very silly questions and the answer should be obvious because oftentimes it is not. Maybe some of my co-panelists have other examples. I, I don't have anything else to add to, to, to that either. I thought that was great. Okay. Uh, so then our, our next question is from Rachel Roca, and it's also been, I think, uh, asked by a few other folks uh, throughout. So uh, she's wondering how, so specifically for early career researchers, whoop, they just got deleted, <laughs> um, for early career researchers, um, or... Uh, go, go, under, go under answer if you look at it, I apologize. <laughs> memorize these things. Okay, for early career researchers or people who are, you know, students specifically, um, how do you, how have you or how do you initiate collaborations with people who are across disciplines, whether they're peers or people who are more experienced than you, if there are specific like concrete examples that you'd be willing to share of, you know, people who did that well with you or things that you did that you think were um, useful. I think that there's just questions related to how you actually create those things at the at the very beginning and how you build relationships with different communities given your interests. I'll jump in again. I feel like I'm speaking a lot, but um, so so I'm going to talk from the perspective of I'm a sociologist working in communication, but I'm also kind of very involved in the computational social science community, um, which is one of one of those. There's a lot of initiatives um, uh, around CSS, um, you know, in terms of bringing people together. In addition to the international conference, there's a lot of summer schools, a lot of workshops that are organized by a bunch of funding bodies um, and they are those workshops and summer schools are, are in design and intended for for juniors <laughs> uh, PhDs or early postdocs um, and I, I think um, you know in, in a couple of those um, uh, I have acted as a mentor I was invited to act as a mentor and what that essentially meant is that I would get together with groups of people you know inter teams of, of students or, po or early postdocs that would uh, you know, work around a specific problem and I would just be there sort of to, to listen to them essentially and kind of steer them in what I thought would be the right direction. But essentially it was a process of co-learning where all of them <laughs> uh, were trying to, you know, to, 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 to make a, a little contribution in terms of how to solve a problem from the different disciplinary backgrounds. Um, and I think that that's a model that that's ideally we should all be applying that model. You know, uh, I, I, we try to do something like that at Penn. Uh, in, in, uh, in, in, it was an undergraduate course that we could taught from the engineering school and, and the communication school. And so again, we made my students and my colleagues from the engineering school students work together in teams to solve very specific problems with very specific tasks. And at first, the students hated each other because they couldn't, you know, they couldn't understand uh, what they were talking about, or they, they care about different things. But I think in the end, they really enjoyed it. And so, uh, and the, pro the the final projects were uh, um, excellent. And and so I, I think those are, you know, and this is, you know, each of us have different mentorship dynamics with our students or young postdocs. I think it very much depends from person to person. Some, you know, different people need different things. Sometimes they need more guidance. Sometimes they need less guidance and they're more independent. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's our task for those of us who are more consolidated to kind of adapt ourselves to the different needs of different people. But I think I really like this co-learning <laughs> model, right? And so... It, you know, be engaging, you know, each of us has very clear ideas of what we want to do and what the good questions and inter interesting questions are, but I think this, and, and we should pursue that, but also, and be self-reliant, but also engage in, in group activities and that will force us to co-learn from each other, right, and I, I think, uh, you know, my advice would be try to get involved in as many of those things as possible. If you're a PhD student, try to apply to summer schools that will have that kind of teaching model. Uh, if you're an early postdoc, do the same, right, and um, and so um, that would be my advice without, you know, it's like diversifying your portfolio or putting different eggs in different baskets. Like you don't, you shouldn't renounce your own unique understanding of what matters in research and what the interesting questions are, uh, but also realize that for some of those questions, you're going to need the help of other people. And, you know, you have a lot to learn from other people. And I think mo most of us from the 
professorship side of things. <laughs> we are trying to create the settings and the opportunities for those things to happen. And so from those of you up and coming, try to engage in as many of those opportunities as possible, because I, I think you know you will enjoy it and and but you have to again again be proactive and try to look for those those opportunities maybe a very quick follow-up um I, I totally agree with what uh, everything that sandra was saying um a, a low cost a low investment way to try some things out might be various hackathons um so for example at osu we have a coding boot camp for for folks and um and so it's so it's part of the boot camp. Folks work on a project, like a week long project, in, in teams, and those projects can be interdisciplinary in terms of what they end up working on. So you kind of get to talk with some folks that are coming at it from different perspectives, work on a tangible problem, and if it sparks your interest, then you can continue on it. And if it doesn't, you know, you you learned how to you sharpen your coding skills and and move on to the next thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was. As quantitative folks, I, I think it's often the case where your skills are in demand. So in, in keeping with the proactive theme, I think if you are proactive, a lot of doors end up being, it's it's often easy to get the first date, if you will, because your skills are in demand. So um, it, they might have misconceptions about the limits of what your skill set can do, but but they're often excited to talk outside of this room. So like, oh, you know what? I've got this problem that I would love to understand more quantitatively. and if you're willing to sit down then and, and explore that on a side project, maybe um, that can be a way to get initially into it, uh, to start to start to build those collaborations. Yeah, I don't think I have much to add to what was said. Thank you, though. Okay, our next question um, comes from uh, Joseph Johnson. Um, how do you approach submitting inter interdisciplinary work to a journal, and I will also say also to a conference proceeding, um, since both of those are in play. And for example, dealing with pushback due to different tools or approaches, um, or even just different culture, I would also say there too, than the standard for a specific scientific community. Yeah, I, um, I don't know that I have great ideas, but I can, just sort of share my reflection. So um, one of my mentors, uh, Milan Tanbe, mentioned this, and I, I thought it was really funny. He was mentioning, so we do similar stuff, right? Um, sort of more in the AI for social impact space. And he was mentioning how sometimes it feels like we have to smuggle our results layered in sort of a lot of optimization problems, right? So we just like add some stuff just to make it, you know, optimization friendly or something, and we can have that to point to, but that's not the thing that we're most excited about. And, you know, I think that's the current unfortunate state of things, but there are sort of like little hacks like that, that you can do that maybe won't detract too much from the quality of your work that maybe, you know, presents it in such a way that you'll face less kind of resistance um, during the reviewing process. Uh, but, you know, there's only so much that that, that, that can do. So I think conference organizers, journals uh, can think critically about, you know, how uh, are they setting things up in such a way that it's friendly to, to people who are crossing disciplinary boundaries. Um, and I think that um, there's a lot of work to do there. I do think, you know, in my sort of very limited experience that it seems to be getting better, at least um, in the corner of computer science that I'm a part of. I'm hopeful about what that means going forward. But yes, there's like definitely a long way to go. So yeah, so I think I would say just definitely we can think more structurally about these things, like how do we set up conferences and journals rather than, you know, what can one individual do to, to mitigate all of all of this? Yeah, I, I agree, and I will I will add that I mean it's true that during the peer review process, to some to some extent, there's some randomness to it that sometimes feels a bit unfair. <laughs> you know, sending the paper to the wrong reviewer is something it's not in your hands; it's the editor's choice. I, I do think, and I wish I realized how much you know, you know, there's some power to how you frame a paper, as as you were saying, Reddy. That that I wish I, I knew when I was younger that, that I had that power. Right? Sometimes. You know, it's very important how you frame your paper, how you motivate the, the paper or the or the uh, submission conference proceedings article, um, and and who you cite and how you engage with existing literature. That will, 
not totally determine who gets to review the paper or how fair the review will be, but you know, you have the power to delimit the scope of the argument in a way that will at least reduce the amount of noise in terms of who gets to review the paper. And when I was younger, I wasn't totally aware of that. And so sometimes, you know, that that makes it even more difficult to find a constituency that will understand your research. Um, uh, and so always remember that you have that power when you're crafting your, your papers and your research. Yeah, I, I don't have I don't have much much to add. I, I, I'll, I'll just say that I, I, it's tricky. It's very tricky. Sometimes you have something that you want to publish and it might maybe what you want to publish actually isn't in where you've got an appointment or, you know, it's not necessarily what would be best career wise. And then it's a tricky decision what to do. Um, and uh, so to ready its earlier point about structural changes that 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 we need to do collectively in academia, I think that's one of them is to make it more easy to just do good science or do good work, uh, regardless of, you know, traditional disciplines. Thank you all. So uh, our next question is from Catherine Deftari. Uh, so she's wondering, is there a, you know, a good way or a best way to balance simplification and rigorous mathematics for non-math or non-academic collaborators? And do you have any advice for kind of maximizing that kind of communication? I feel like I would like Mason to answer this question, actually. <laughs> I'm genuinely interested in what your answer would be, because you, you worked a lot with, you know, you're a mathematician, but you worked a lot with social. Okay, I've been recruited to the panel. Fine. Um, sure, I, I'll, give a, I'll give a quick answer. And then, of course, since we have the Slack and so on, I'll be happy to expound on that for others. Um, I tend to enjoy problems that I understand. So I tend to shy away from ones where there are black boxes or there are too many pieces. And so that of course is gonna require a huge amount of simplification by necessity. And the thing is though, when you simplify it, you wanna somehow keep the essence of the problem that you're interested in rather than throwing it away. So you could have two models say that are comparably simple and one of them might be insightful for a sociological question, and one of them might not be, but they're both actually really simple. And if you think even about a bunch of the models that we think about in mathematics, um, you know, we talk about threshold model. Mark Granovetter is actually invented by a sociologist, not by a mathematician, right? A bunch of these models that we attribute to mathematicians, actually the sociologists and others, you know, um, it's true in biology as well. I happen to know the sociology ones better. Simplifications are also done by the, the disciplinary scientists. So look at the questions they're asking and what do they think that something simple can, can ask. But um, the thing that I shy away from that there is a lot of, um, and I'm gonna blame the physicists because it's popular, but it's actually true also in other disciplines. If I am asking a sociological question if I write a paper that's by mathematicians for mathematicians, I'm not really asking a sociological question. So you wanna not lose the essence. Simplification is good, but you wanna not lose the essence. Okay, I'm gonna step back off the panel now since I'm not supposed to be on the panel, but thank you, Sandra. You're welcome, I totally agree with the answer. <laughs> okay, did, did any of the other panelists want to comment on this at all? All right, moving swiftly onward. Um, this is gonna be a segue because I was actually, Sandra didn't know this, but I was going to pin a certain one on her. And now, now since she's done it on me, I don't have to feel guilty about it. Um, so this was asked a little while ago and I know we're running out of time, so we're gonna get to a lot of questions, unfortunately. But one of the things that we deal with a lot, and it's not just interdisciplinary work, it also shows up in, within a discipline, credentialism. In this case, my discipline is better than your discipline attitudes. And, and okay, it, it'd be great to just for people not to have them, but then in practice, they're there and we have to somehow deal with them. So Sandra, you've worked with physicists. How do you deal with this? You just roll with it when, they, yeah, I think uh, no serious physicists would ever claim that they are better than, <laughs> but those jokes abound, but also within fields, right? Like depending on what kind of branch of specialization you have within sociology, there's a, there's a pecking order and I don't think we should, you know, it's obvious that there's a pecking order in academia and I'm not gonna be the one denying it. But I also feel that when you are in, you know, 
in a team of serious collaborators who care as much as you do in finding the right answers to the right questions. Uh, you know, I've never encountered seriously anyone's having that attitude of I'm just not going to go your way because I think I'm, you know, uh, but you, you do have to deal with, <laughs> with, with that sometimes, you know, going back to the question about reviewers assessing your work when you, you know, depending on who the reviewer is and how, you know, um, orthodox they are in their understanding of what counts as a contribution <laughs> or narrow minded, then, you know, you have to, you have to negotiate that. But, um, I mean, I, yeah, I don't think that's an issue in the context of, real, of, 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 of teams of people from different backgrounds who really care about producing something together, uh, honestly. And if you encounter that kind of attitude, you probably shouldn't be working with that person. <laughs> I mean, that pecking order, we also have that even internally within fields, right? So um, I was, uh, so I, I was on the faculty job market last year and as part of that, I was, you know, giving a lot of um, talks before officially going on the market to see what places I wanted to apply to. And one of the places where I um, were, where I was considering applying to, I gave a seminar talk, and at the end of it, um, uh, like a very senior researcher uh, in in the field came up to me and said, "Great talk. Um, so, do you consider yourself a computer scientist, a social scientist, or an activist?" Right. And this was, you know, I was giving a talk on a sort of optimization based problem that was inspired by questions of uh, poverty and in particular the impact of income shocks on marginalized communities on, on poverty. Right. And so, you know, I, I, you know, clearly care a lot about this, the domain itself. I've learned as much as I can about it. I, I you know, I try to motivate the question that I was asking, but ultimately the problem that I was solving was an optimization problem. And so, it was a little bit jarring to me to receive that um, because it was a uh, it was it was sort of clear that that was not a compliment, right? It was not meant to be, you know, good for you. You're doing stuff that's like advocacy related. It was definitely not that. And so I uh, I was able to sort of respond as best as I could at the time. I said, you know, um, I consider myself a computer scientist. I have you know a computer science PhD. My advisor is a computer scientist. All my mentors are uh, that you would know are computer scientists. Uh, and so I, you know, I said, in our field, we have a, a, a really nice tradition of looking outwards, right? And so in econ, uh, in econ CS, for instance, there's a lot of work in ad auctions, um, advertising auctions, where um, computer scientists have had a, a lot of direct impact, actually, right? And so there, you know, you go and you learn about challenges that um, I guess companies here would face on in advertising um, uh, in, ad in advertising things, and you know what types of auction theory related questions that you would have there, and you try to make some some sort of progress, right? And so while you know the application domain is not one I'm particularly excited about, I actually do like the process that they went through to sort of uh, bridge this research and practice pipeline. And so you know I I explained to the person. Of course, you have colleagues in your own department that have done this, and it's awesome. You 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 surely agree. And I'm kind of going through a similar process, except that at the end of the pipeline, um, I'm looking at questions of poverty and inequality. But the process is 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 not sort of from a computational or technical perspective. It's not actually much different. And so it was fine. I think that ended up being fine. But I did I do think that this sort of pecking order. It's not just across fields. I think even internally, as soon as you start kind of shifting in a way that people don't necessarily expect they they they, they also try to create a hierarchy within that um, i don't have any advice for how to deal with that i you know i i i tend to just kind of look past it and keep it moving although i did know at the time um that you know that those kinds of comments were probably a sign that maybe the job market was not gonna uh that i had to be very careful about how i was presenting myself on the job market right so Nevertheless, she persisted. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, since we're running out of time, I'm going to pass it to Al to do a sort of final wrap up question to everybody. Sounds great. Thanks, Mason. So our, our final question is we just wanted to ask either if you have any final advice you'd like to share or something exciting about where the field is moving or questions that you're interested in in complex social systems. So either one. Maybe there are no interesting questions. I can no. There's so many. There's so many. I'm happy to jump in. So I uh, I've been really interested in questions related to poverty and inequality, which I think you know sociologists and economists and social workers and uh, people in the social sciences more generally have been thinking about for 
for a very, very, very long time. But I think on the computational side of things, there's been a lot less work. Uh, but there's a lot of really interesting questions there and a lot of, um, uh, I guess, low hanging fruits for lack of a better phrase. And so uh, I'll just mention here that um, that's something that I'm really excited about. I guess I'll just link you to the MD4SG initiative, uh, just because that's where a lot of the work I've done has 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 been happening or has been deeply inspired by. Um, and there's a working group specifically on inequality that has been really transformative for my own research and like really generative that I am linking to all panelists and attendees. So you can take a look there. But if you're interested in computational questions related to poverty and inequality and social work also, uh, feel free to reach out. I'm very happy to talk. Yeah, and I, I will say we, we let the gentleman until the end. Uh, Joseph, you'll be last. But I, I think, um, you know, social networks pre-exist digital technologies, they pre-exist any sort of technology. And so, you know, social networks have a long history, but I, I never, I, I think th there's never been a, a more exciting time to do research on networks um, and how, you know, and, and all the different ways in which they have an impact on how we live and how we organize. And um, and so, you know, the, the in, in terms of, of, of emerging fields, computational social science, I wouldn't say it's so emerging anymore. I think it's consolidating itself. Um, and it's bringing people from all these different backgrounds. And I think, you know, I, I wish sometimes that I could start my PhD right now just to enjoy the moment. But I, so I think there's, you know, there's never been a more exciting moment to be um, an unorthodox sociologist, right? Like, so <laughs> those who bring uh, insights from all these different disciplines. And so if this is something that you're interested in, and I believe we have a group later in, in 15 minutes to talk more about social networks. And, <laughs> uh, you know, if you're interested in these, there couldn't be a better moment to start your PhDs or, or kind of to, to start your projects. Um, and so, yeah, uh, go for it. Uh, you know, the, 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 I'm, I'm sure you'll have a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say that I mean, at that intersection of like interesting and useful, uh, I think this field is squarely in that in that intersection. Um, if you want to do impactful work beyond beyond academia, this this area is is a super rich area to do that. If you want to study interesting mathematical problems, there's a wealth of interesting problems here that arise. So, whatever scope you are wanting to tackle things, I think there's problems here for you. Okay, great. So. Thank you to all of our panelists, and wonderful. Um, I know that we didn't get to a lot of questions by necessity. We are going to put them in the Slack. And I mean, if, if the panelists are willing to comment on those, great. Um, I know that everyone's busy. If they're not, then those of us who are organizers and others who are participants may have their own thoughts on those, but we can, we can keep the discussion there. And then we'll also have another, um, another panel tomorrow. So thanks all.